All right, so let's work through some questions. Okay, so we're calculating degrees of unsaturation and we figure that out it's one. So there's, in fact, we see in the IR spectrum, there's a carbonyl there. Ignore the fingerprint region. These are just the sp3 hybridized CHs. We see them in just about every spectrum. Okay, uh, 14 protons. So it looks like we've got, what do you think, four? four and six perhaps, that would be 14. Remember there's a video on, on how to calculate the integrals, the area under those peaks, and, and how to translate that to number of protons. Okay, so let's just copy this information over here. I'm just writing these down, these chemical shifts down approximately, but if you're actually doing this, say, in a, in a lab and doing this for a publication, uh, the computer can precisely uh, pick or identify the, the peak locations uh, for you. So we've got a triplet, so we know n equals 2. Uh, we've got a, a multiplet, in fact, a nice sextet, so we might say multiplet or we might say sextet. Sextet. There we go. And then we've got uh, a triplet, so another n equals 2. All right. So we can't have a CH4, or rather, if we did have a CH4, that'd be the end of the molecule. So we're probably looking at two chemically equivalent CH2 groups. Same thing over here. And 2 times CH3. Okay, so we know we've got a carbonyl. Uh, at this point, if we just double check with the formula, so there's one carbon there, two, four, six, we've got our seven, we've got all our protons, oxygen's taken care of. There's the one degree of unsaturation that we needed to keep an eye out for. So now we're ready to put the pieces together. Okay, so that carbonyl group is a nice kind of center point for the molecule. We've got a peak around 2.3, so that can be these CH2 groups right next to the carbonyl. So they'd be chemically equivalent with this line of symmetry right down the middle there. Okay, then maybe we have these two other CH2s, two other methylenes. <clears throat> Okay, maybe they're there. And then ending off with uh, those two methyls. Okay, double check that that fits all the data. So we've got these protons A around two, that makes sense, they're next to the carbonyl group. 1.6 alkyl protons, some are removed from that carbonyl group, and then alkyl protons at about 0.9. There we go, so there's the molecule. Okay, so infrared information is given to us. Let's calculate degree of unsaturation first. So du equals two times five plus one is uh, plus two plus one for the nitrogen minus seven for the hydrogen atoms. No, ignore the oxygen. All divided by two. So I see three degrees of unsaturation in there. Um, Okay, this peak at 2266 is not much that comes in the middle of the IR spectrum there. We're typically looking at uh, either CC triple bonds or CN triple bonds. So an, an alkynyl group or a nitrile group. And then a carbonyl group there. So that's our three degrees of unsaturation taken care of. One for the pi bond and the carbonyl, two for either the CC or the CN bond. So before we decide on what that functional group is, let's take a look at what's happening in the rest of the molecule. 
So at about 4.2, we have a two-age integration. We're told that that value, quartet, so it's next to three protons. Uh, we've got something at, what, 3.5, just about 3.4, 3.5, integrating for two. It's a singlet, so no proton neighbors. <clears throat> and then we've got something at 1.2, integrating for three. It's a triplet, and n equals two. Okay, so in terms of what this might be, integrating for 2H, well, let's think about a CH2. Another 2H, CH2. Uh, and then a CH3. Okay, so we still had to decide what whether it's a CC triple bond or a CN triple bond. <clears throat> so let's compare back to the number of carbon atoms in the formula. Um, so we've got one, two, three, in terms of the functional groups we've already seen, four. So we only have room, space in the formula and then in the molecule itself for one more carbon uh, atom. If we had a CC triple bond there, we, we, we would go past what we know is the formula. Plus we need a nitrogen atom. So that tells us then in fact we've got a nitrile group in this molecule and not an alkyne. Okay, so let's take it down below here. Okay, just recapping what we know. So we've got a carbonyl to work with. We need to work with a nitrile. We've got a CH. Two methylenes. I'm trying to draw them so I can connect them together as fragments more easily, um, and a CH3. Now, if you're doing this uh, at home on paper, I would suggest actually you get a sticky note and write each of the fragments onto these sticky notes. And you could even label it to remind yourself of, of which one it was. So maybe this is B, and it's supposed to have a chemical shift of 3.5, and it's supposed to be a singlet. So no neighbors. And then as you are moving these sticky notes around, you can try to attach them at different locations and see where they fit or where they don't fit. So I, I suggest you do this with some, you know, something you can move around on, on paper. You can do it here. Um, and then once you find stuff that doesn't work out, write down the structures that didn't work out and why. Um, often what happens is that people cycle back to the same ideas over and over again. Um, so so writing it down, writing why it didn't work, uh, helps to remind you not to keep cycling back to that same thing. All right. So let's just try something and see how it goes. Okay, so if I try this right away, then I compare back to the multiplicity. One of these uh, methylenes, CH2s, has to be a singlet. So there's no way they can be side by side with each other. So this pink one, uh, because it's a singlet, has to be isolated. So I've got to keep an eye out for that. If I move it to the other side, can I think about putting CH2, CH3 together? Well, a CH3 is supposed to be a triplet next to a CH2. That works out. That methylene yellow is supposed to be a quartet. That works out. In terms of chemical shift, well, if it were next to a carbonyl, it would have a chemical shift of around 2 ppm. It's around 4.2, and that makes me think that it should be next to an oxygen. So I've just compared back to the formula. I realized, yeah, we're missing another oxygen atom here. So if I just bump that over and bring that oxygen in there, now it's at a now it would have that right, the proper chemical shift. It still has the right multiplicity. Alright, we've got this methylene out by itself at the moment. One more fragment to put onto that to that molecule. Let me just bring that over, flip it around, and attach it on there.
Okay, so we have to make sure, double check with the formula that should have, um, you know, be fairly deshielded. It's next to a carbonyl group and to another electron withdrawing group. So each electron withdrawing group uh, deshields it, pulls away even more electron density, keeps shifting it to the left on that spectrum. CH2, that's going to be a quartet and be in, uh, have a chemical shift about four, which we see. And then a methyl, um, so regular alkyl group, not directly next to an electron drawing, withdrawing group, uh, with chemical shift about 1.2. And because it has two non-equivalent neighbors, it had, it's going to be a triplet. So there's that molecule. Okay, so one degree of unsaturation. There's a carbonyl base on the IR, so there's the degree of unsaturation taken care of. So if we write down all this information that we have, around five, that's quite deshielded. Um, proton one peak, it's, uh, it's seven, so it has six non-equivalent neighbors. Okay, and then we've got a peak at about two, another up about, what, one, one point two. which is a singlet and that looks like it's a doublet so n equals one and n equals zero and their integrations are three and six we know from the infrared that there's a carbonyl there's another oxygen atom in there so maybe that's uh, it could be an oh for that other oxygen or it could be an o let's see what else comes out uh, from the table Okay, so that what single H could be a CH or an OH. Pretty unlikely for an, a hydroxyl group to have that kind of multiplicity, but let's keep it in mind just to keep our options open for a second. Okay, we've got a methyl there, and 6H is probably two chemically equivalent methyls. All right. So in terms of number of atoms here, uh, we need five carbon atoms. We've got one from the carbonyl, two, three, four. We need the one more. So that tells us that there's probably uh, an oxygen atom instead on its own, not a hydroxyl. There's that CH. We've got a, a methyl. And then two others that are chemically equivalent. All right, so let's try putting some pieces together. Start with a common functional group. It's not necessarily this, so I have to always keep that in mind. Um, so that CH is really, really deshielded with that, oops, with that um, chemical shift of five. So I'm gonna try getting it right next to that uh, oxygen atom here. It's gonna have one other thing, there we go. And I know that methyl group is a singlet um, with a chemical shift of about two. So that's, that puts it right next to the, a carbonyl group. So it makes sense to put that over here. And then we've got two spots on that methine, the CH, for these, for these methyl groups. There we go. So because those methyl groups would each have one neighbor, they would become a, they together become a doublet and they're in the same chemical environment. So there is one signal that splits into a doublet because of that CH group. And then on its part, that CH has N equals six. So by the N plus one rule, six plus one is seven. So that's why we see seven peaks for it that integrate for one proton. So that's that one.
All right, pause the video here, try to give this one a try. Uh, one thing I will point out as you get going with this one is that, uh, so the spectrum was actually for this one quite long, went all the way out to 12. So this part here was way over on the left and the peak was really low in the baseline way over on the left. So low that it was hard to, hard to see. So what they did on the computer to print this out is they raised it up four times the intensity so that we could see the peak better. So we can see that it's a broad singlet. Okay, so degree of unsaturation of one, looks like we've got a carbonyl. The other thing, it's a bit tricky to see, it's the first time you've probably seen something like this before, but there's a, it's actually a peak that's rounded, that's tucked underneath, it's so broad that it's tucked underneath a whole bunch of other ones. And so that's not only an OH, but probably an OH of a carboxylic acid. And that's supported by this peak over at 12 here, the broad singlet, um, that's where carboxylic acid protons appear in the proton NMR. So it looks then that we have a carboxylic acid um, and then just some peaks, you know, the regular kind of peaks that we see. I'm not sure that this is actually something that we want to pay attention to. So, all right. So we've got that peak around, let's call it, uh, I don't know, 11.9, 1H broad singlet. And we've said that it's the carboxylic acid. Then we've got a peak at, say, 2.4. Integrating for two, it's a quartet, so N equals three. So likely thinking about a CH2 there. And then we've got something at, I don't know, about 1.1. Integrating for three protons, it's a triplet. Uh, so next to two neighbors, that looks like that's a methyl group. Okay, so it shouldn't be too bad, I don't think, for us to put these pieces together. No symmetry to worry about. Uh, we can double check one, two, three carbon atoms. That's what we have in the formula. Two oxygens. We have all the atoms taken care of. So really just one way to put these ones all together. All right, give a try for this one. Okay, two degrees of unsaturation. We also see two peaks, so two carbonyl groups there. So three oxygen atoms in the formula. There's one, there's two, and maybe there's three, or maybe there's a CH. No, I don't see any single CH peaks, so it makes more sense for it to be oxygen. So we've got 4.2, 3.5, 2.2, one. Notice that I'm really estimating those chemical shifts. We would pick them out if really precisely if we were doing this for say a publication or to report to other scientists in another way, there we go. Okay, so let's try this point. If you didn't get this far, pause again. Try to put one of these um, options together and see what you get. OK, 
Okay, so one common functional group is, um, is an anhydride like this. So then I might think about, here, let's just copy that, paste that here. Okay, so what if I did CH2, CH2, Okay, so unfortunately that one doesn't work out because then I'd have this lovely plane of symmetry and I'd actually only have two types of protons in the whole molecule. So that doesn't work. So got to try something different. Okay, what if I take that most deshielded set of protons, put them between the two carbonyl groups. Um, it's a quartet though, so that doesn't that doesn't work. What if I take the next most deshielded set of there we go. So they're a singlet, they'd be stuck between two groups, no non-equivalent proton neighbors. Okay. And then put one of the oxygen atoms next to the carbonyl. Then maybe a deshielded proton. It's now a quartet. It should be near something that makes it into a triplet, as a, would make it, there we go. Okay, before I compare back to the data, let's see what I, I, I anticipate. So proton next to a carbonyl should be at about two, and this one should be a singlet, because there's no non-equivalent neighbors. Okay, double check with the data, it's at about two. Of course, integrates for three being a methyl, singlet, no non-equivalent neighbors. So we're good for that one. Next one, methylene, quite deshielded because it's not only next to a carbonyl that would put it at two, but it's further deshielded by another group that would bump it down to uh, somewhere between three and four. So three to four, and it would be a singlet, so that works out also. Next one, we expect that to be those protons next to oxygen to be between three and five, um, even closer to the five side because those this electron density is pulled away from the oxygen atom through resonance. Okay, so three to five, and we would expect because it's next to a methyl to be a quartet. And that is in fact what we see. And then we expect, you know, the regular proton on a methyl to be around one, just in an alkyl environment. Um, and because they're next to two non-equivalent protons, we expect them to be a triplet. So that works out too. Okay, so we tried a couple of possibilities. First possibility didn't work out with the data. Tried another possibility. That one did work out. Okay, there we go. All right, so one last one in this set of notes here. Some aromatic rings to think about. So notice in this first one, plane of symmetry down the middle. I suggest you draw out all the protons, especially as you get used to this at first, so you don't forget about any of them. So that plane of symmetry renders each half of the molecule equivalent to each other, and so there's protons of the methyl group, protons on the benzene that's closest to that uh, aniline group, and then protons that are farther away. So in total we'd see three proton types in that molecule. Okay, so in the next one over there's no plane of symmetry. Now the thing is with these protons on the nitrogen atom is that if this nitrogen is spinning really freely, on average this methyl is going to be, you know, sometimes half the time say close to this bromine, half the time far, the other methyl half the time close to the bromine, half the time far. So on average as it spins around they'd be in the same overall chemical environment. So we would count them as one proton. And then for each of these other ones around here, so we might call them HA, then we'd have HB, close to the nitrogen, C, kind of between two, D, and E, so we'd see five signals in total. 
The thing is that sometimes this rotation is actually hindered. And so instead of actually having two different, uh, two identical on average proton environments, chemical environments for these protons, sometimes this group gets kind of frozen in place. And that particularly happens in situations when there's resonance, so that partial double bond hinders rotation around that CN bond, makes it hard for the group to spin. And so if that's the situation, then one of these groups is gonna be essentially locked really close to the bromine, and one of them will be locked farther from the bromine. So in that case, we'd have, uh, we call it proton A again, and then proton F, two different protons. In that case, we'd get two different chemical environments. And in fact, we can do experiments in the NMR spectrometer where we, if, as the temperature gets higher and higher, there's more energy available to the system. It's enough energy for that free rotation, so we start to see just that single peak situation. As the temperature cools off, there's less and less energy available for the molecules. That rotation around that bond becomes harder, and so we end up with a situation of the two being locked out. So bottom line, you could answer five or six as long as you can justify the answer that you give. Same situation for this last one. We might say that there's free rotation around that bond and so we have A and A. They're on average in the same environment. So we might say five. Or alternatively, it might be the case that free rotation is hindered because of that resonance. And so then we could call one of them A and the other one we could call F. And there would be six proton signals in total.